Hello, folks. Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 73, and tonight I have all four of the Sanger brothers, uh, Jeff, Rick, Kevin, and Mark on with me, and uh, pretty average athletes back in the day, but good guys, so I'm glad to have them on, uh, talking about uh, their their folks, their days playing at Central and West Hancock. Pretty excited for that. I have 19 sponsors for tonight, so a lot of money funneling into the Sanger Legacy Fund, so thanks again to all you sponsors that you see on my screen. As always, the Sanger Legacy Fund money is used for the West Hancock Hall of Fame, scholarships for graduating seniors. We support athletic activity funds, any other community outreach programs as needed. Uh, if you want to give to the uh, Sanger Legacy Fund, you can go to sangerstrong.com. If you want to sponsor any of the podcast episodes coming up, let me know as well. Uh, one way that I'm hoping to help fund the uh, Sanger Legacy Fund is through the book I've been writing. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Uh, there's the button. Uh, the book I've been writing for about the last two years is called On West Hancock. It's the history of Britain, West Hancock football and wrestling programs. Uh, Diane Troutman, uh, I just talked on the phone to her the other day. She spent 11 hours of her Saturday the other day editing this book. She's spent endless hours on this, um, helping me put it together and edit it. So if you want to buy a book, uh, please Facebook message me or send me an email. I'm up to 200 copies sold, so that means there's 600 left if you'd like a copy. So let me know. I'm going to be a, a lot of fun to look through. Uh, again, I have 19 sponsors for tonight. I have Triple B's, Katie Salon and Tanning and Titanka, Jay Hiscox of State Farm Insurance, Nick Schmidt, and Sportsman's Corner in Algona, and Westside Eagle Storage in Britt. I'm going to get to the other ones here in a little bit. So introductions here, just to make sure everyone knows who's who. Let's just go around quick, let everyone know who you are, where you're at these days, and what's keeping you busy, and then we'll start talking some sports. Mostly basketball, right, Jeff? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. What's up? Uh, Jeff, I would have graduated in 97, um, living in Montezuma now. Uh, been in Montezuma for uh, five years, uh, married, uh, have a... 21 year old 22 year old stepson that's getting married in june uh, and still working at uh central college so living a good life are you rick uh, i'm rick i uh i am down in urbandale actually uh waukee school district my girl's uh twin uh twin daughters who are eighth graders at waukee northwest um my wife danielle um i'm, I'm class of 92 she's class of 97 um she's uh look at jeff laugh all right um yeah so we're kind of staying busy with with uh work and all their activities that are ramping up as they get into a lot of school sports down here that all starts in eighth grade instead of seventh grade and all club stuff prior to that so that's uh so we're spending a lot of our time kevin i'm kevin sanger i live in mankato um my son nick's a fifth grader emily's a fourth grader I get back to Brick quite often with my office there, but uh, just trying to stay busy with the kids' activities and keeps me moving. Last but not least. Uh, Mark, I uh, live back in our, um, where we all grew up on our home farm. Uh, wife, Taylor, uh, two little girls, and Lyndon and Lennon, um, teaching and coaching back in uh, West Hancock. Nice. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. I I was joking with these guys getting this thing ready. I'm like, I don't know if I even need to put notes together. I might just say, go and let you start making fun of each other. So we'll we'll see where it takes us. But uh, third, real quick here, uh, just uh, obviously you guys have football in common. The four of you, three of the four of you wrestled. All of you guys were out the track and and uh, did that with your for your dad. Uh, I wasn't sure about baseball. Did any of you guys play baseball in high school? I know Rick did. We all did, yeah. Okay. Uh, how, how'd that go? Coach Timmerman, for the most part, I'm guessing, for most of you guys? Yep. I had three. I said, Kevin had Coach Timmerman, right, for your all, all four years? Coach, Coach Timmerman the whole time. Yep. And then uh, Kevin Zeesman coached for two seasons. Um, my And he had, he had been down in Kanawha. So we consolidated my <clears> – <throat> excuse me, my, so, my sophomore year. Uh, and then Kevin Zeesman was coaching for two seasons. And then uh, – um. Uh, oh my gosh, we just had him on the episode. Doug Sickles. Sickles, good lord. Um, was our was our came in our senior year and coached. 
So I had three different coaches through our our uh, high school uh, baseball career. Did you have Sickles the whole time? I would have had Sickles all four years. And then Sickles yep. would have been my junior high basketball coach as well. Oh, yeah. Yep, he was our junior high football coach. He was a, he was a coach when I started baseball. Mark Eisman took over after Sickles did. Which we his were, podcast uh, was interesting because I didn't know that Sickles came to Britt from Garrigan. Yeah, he didn't? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had no idea on that. I kind of forgot that he was from Wapsie, right? I mean, he grew up and he was from Wapsie, and then he was his first coach or first teaching. Yeah, was that uh, was that Garrigan? And then came yeah, over. So he, he played for Coach Softmade. <laughs> yeah, I never yeah. had any idea. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure he had some good stories. Uh, how many home runs did you guys hit? Do you, any uh, go out of, over the fence? <laughs> I had one. I think I got lucky and caught one just right at Lake Mills. I don't know. I had some home runs. I don't. I don't know how many. <clears throat> I, I know we got beat. We got beat in the district final my senior year by Garrigan one nothing. And I, I hit one off the off the sign in center field, so that one wasn't long enough. Why <laughs> did you go home? I was, was going to say, I know you almost had one at Bancroft. Yep. Yep. Unfortunately, it was almost. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Coach Timmerman, going back to him real, real quick, he's a 2023 Hall of Famer. Uh, just let him know this winter. What can you guys say about him as a baseball coach, teacher, AD? You name it, and you, your him and your dad knew each other obviously for a lot of years. Yeah, they were history because me and Mark grew up together. Mark was a good friend of mine, a year older than me, so Mark spent a lot of time at our house, and I spent a lot of time at their house. So it was kind of a memorable experience with the time that I spent with uh, Jim and Jan, and uh, good friends of mom and dad's, and a lot of a lot of really good memories. Yeah, and they went to they went to school at Upper Iowa together too. I think I think they graduated. Were they same year? I think that Jim and Dad are real close. And excuse me, and Mom. So we were in Upper Iowa at the same time, and then uh, and then came to Britt. And now we have a lot of memories of the Timmermans growing up. Uh, it's it's kind of funny. One that I remember is I don't know how old we would have been, Kevin, but um, when Jeff got pneumonia, Jeff, you had to be I don't know three, two, young. He got sick and had pneumonia. I remember you and I were we were we were young, probably I don't know, eleven, ten years. You were probably eleven, ten years old, and I was probably I don't know, seven or eight, maybe a little younger than that. I remember we had, we were staying at their house. His mom and dad were were going back and forth, uh, and then when Jeff was sick, so it's kind of funny some of those things that you remember going going years back that have nothing to do with <laughs> school or athletics. Yeah, <clears throat> I remember when Bob Horner was talking about when his girls would come out and ride the three wheeler with motorcycles around the the farm and he was scared for the his li- girl's life and actually mark got in a couple wrecks and he had to go to the emergency room with mark timmerman i'm speaking of you know so that <laughs> well was it yeah. mark actually, mark's right. the one that was driving the three-wheeler and there was like three of us on it or three of you on it and he was heading straight for a tree and everybody else was smart enough to jump off and he just drove into the tree wasn't that mark yeah broke his ankle yeah <laughs> not yeah. this mark no mark timmerman, mark timmerman. Not this one, yeah. 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 Mark, Mark had street smarts. He knew to jump off. <laughs> yeah, we probably go back. As, we probably go back with all like the other coaches that we grew up with that were around at some point in time with the stories of you know their kids and us running around and breaking stuff, breaking bones. I remember one where we we were climbing up on top of the sheds. I think it was Terry Barton's. I don't think it was his daughters. I think it was his like his nieces that were out at our farm, and we were climbing on top of the sheds and climbing around and they got stuck on top of a shed we could we could we we were you know we boys were climbing all over everything and they got st- stuck on top of a shed and they had to go out and, and get them down like yeah we were we were we were doing all kinds of stupid stuff when we were growing up <laughs> if you get if you get back to mr timmerman you know i had mr timmerman he would have been the ad when i was in school he was our science teacher when we were in school uh, he was yep. still helping with football i mean he was there on all the friday nights there on all the trips uh, all those sorts of things. But the thing I remember the most about Mr. Timmerman is, I mean, he had to be a good athlete growing up. Cause I mean, if he was golfing, he was good. I can remember when we got the pool table and they'd come out and play pool and he was good at pool. Um, you know, I know, I don't know if I ever saw him play ping pong or not, but the things I remember is like growing up, like him and dad would go out golfing. <laughs> and most of the time, you know, I know this is PG-13, but most of the time he would kick dad's ass when they were golfing. 
you know, dad would stay close and he'd be like, yeah, you know, I go off to 41 and Jim was a 38. And, you know, if dad was a 49, he was lucky, you know, we'd be next to a tree and he'd kick it away from the tree and he'd swing and miss. And, and, you know, Jim was just, <laughs> he was really good. And, you know, he was smooth. You could tell he was a good golfer. And then dad was not those things, but it was, it was just kind of funny because dad was so competitive <laughs> and Jim was just, he was really good. I remember golf specifically. So that's why he was also, so Jim would all, he, Terman would also been, he was a junior high football coach. Like he was the junior high oh, head yeah. football coach for a lot of years. Yep. So when I was in junior high, he was our, our uh, football coach. Pretty sure he ran the whole summer rep program when I was going through yep. too. Yeah. He, he controlled right. all he of did. it. Yeah. I remember right. He used to, I remember when I came back, I used to have the privilege to golf with Mr. Terman, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Carter, and and my dad and those guys. And I tell you what, some of the stories you got to hear there, they're a little different from the other side of the tracks than, than what we were growing up. You think you're getting away with stuff, and they had a, they knew everything that was going on. Sure seen that <laughs> way anyway. But, uh, yep. <clears throat> when you guys talk about, like, climbing on the sheds at home and four-wheelers and, like, what, how'd your parents respond to that? Were they either not there or were they getting after you for stuff like that? My no, mom, was motorcycle. When Rick was what, how old were you, Rick? Six, five. Right. Yeah. We Twenty bought five. a motorcycle from the fairgrounds at the fair. We <laughs> saw this motorcycle like a couple years in a row and we bugged mom and dad enough. We bought it and Rick put it through the barbed wire fence within five minutes. We had it and brought it home. He was on his way to the emergency room. So they were there, but. We didn't do a very good job of wearing a helmet or anything. I think Even had a, time, mom was just glad we weren't in the house. <laughs> <laughs> True. We break, if, if we're breaking our bones outside, at least we're not breaking stuff in the house, right? Or dumping planters with plants all over the floor, hitting with footballs and stuff. So, <laughs> But what I'm hearing is you guys hit your deductible pretty quick every year in the health insurance plan the school provided for your, for you guys. I don't know. I had a lot of stitches. I didn't, I didn't break really many bones. I don't think I broke any bones growing up. I had a lot of stitches. <laughs> we'll say that much. <clears throat> Adds up. Well, let's get to some track and field here. Uh, your dad was the coach at Britain West Hancock for 51 track seasons, uh, four state titles, four runner ups. Uh, I just put dozens. It's in the 20 ish uh, between individual and relay team championships. Uh, what are some of your favorite track and field moments with your dad and Coach Howie? I look back, I mean, I don't really remember the early years. I mean, like when Bob Swears and Doug Pooch and that those good teams in the early 70s were there. The first I remembered, I'd go out to practice most days with dad just to kind of mess around or be at practice. And the, the some of the individuals I remember, Jeff Nielsen was one of the first ones I remember running and I think he graduated in 79. I think that's right here. I'm not sure, but I mean, he's a, probably one of the most elite track and field athletes in the state of Iowa. Um, you know, and some of the things he did was amazing. Um, that's one of my first recollections from our track program, track and field program. Well, and if, yeah. if you, if you'd pick, like if you would ask dad what his top five memories were from high school coaching and you go football track anything i imagine that jeff nielsen anchoring the mile relay whatever year that was at the state track had to be if not the top one of the top because every year we went down to state track we always sat in the same place and he, every year he'd tell the same story and by the end of, by the time he got done telling the story that guy was 200 meters out on jeff nielsen when he <laughs> took the baton i mean that guy was coming up the back stretch and jeff I think was taking the center. baton to was go get center? him Right, wasn't it Sioux Center that year? He said yeah. that was. And I, I think Dad told the story that they flipped all their kids. Yeah. So they they flipped everyone to get way out, and then when Nielsen took the baton, I mean, it just he reeled that kid in, and I mean, I think he split like forty three five or something like that. <laughs> it was fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, I, I mean, do think he told that story every year. He did. He told that story every year. Yeah. He <laughs> liked that one. Yeah, I know. I just, I mean, I can remember growing up. I mean, state track was like vacation. I mean, it was, that's when the boys track meet was three days, I think. Or was it always just two days? Maybe it was two days. You know, we got, we got off of school. Uh, we'd get to go down to the state track meet. 
And uh, I mean, it, it was, it was fun there. Cause when I was growing up and you know, the years when I was old enough to know what was going on, I mean, we were very competitive at the state track meet, you know, I can remember, uh, you know, obviously Rick's senior year running the, winning the state track meet. That was, um, you know, just a lot of fun. And like I said, I was just to the age where I kind of understood what was going on. Uh, not old enough to understand four by two splits and, and, uh, all that good stuff, but yeah. I don't know if we want to get into that. But <laughs> you mean who ran the really slow split or only ran about 175 meters? Well, I mean, if you look at it, Rick ran the fastest 200 meter split in the history of the state track meet. Exactly, exactly. But he only ran yep. 160 meters. <laughs> hey, whatever it takes. Care to explain, Rick? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> we, uh, my senior year, we had some we had some guys that were uh, fast. We had, uh, you know, Nate Smith, Chuck Christians, Jeremy Don, a lot of good sprinters. And, uh, and I got to fill in um, and try to, I tried to take the baton as late as I could from Nate. And I tried to hand it off as early as I could to Jeremy in the four by two. <laughs> so that was the, uh, that, that was the strategy. And, uh, and we, so we said my class, you know, we had a lot of good guys that were good athletes and fast, <clears throat> but you know, we had those three guys that were sprinters that uh you know you could we could basically build these relays around and obviously nate you know he could win some of the opens on his own and and gosh jeremy and i mean you got a kid a guy like nate who's a four-time 100 meter dash champion and then you got two guys that went second and fifth in the open 200 that year um you, you know, you that's back before you could have four events back before you could have four and that was track. that was when he could only be in three running events um and they and they actually and they scored the individual events I think it was uh, seven, five, four, three, two, one. They only scored six places, and then they scored the relays uh, ten, eight, six, four, three, two, or what? However, they did it with the with the scoring system. So now, you know, today you can you can run four events, and they score the individual events the same as they score the relays. So you see teams putting up a you know a ton of points at the state track meet. We set the state record that year in a four by two, didn't we? Nope, nope. I think we were we were close. Uh, and then like Spirit Lake, I think Spirit Lake had a good group. Um, was it Spirit Lake or was it Alta? I can't remember. One of those teams that that had broke it, they ran like 129 something, I think a year or two after that. Yeah. So <clears throat> they're pretty fast. Because because Jeremy's was, uh, I mean, he was really close to winning the 200, wasn't he? Yeah. He got I mean, beat by a kid from Minneapolis. Kid from Minneapolis. I, I want to say it was like 100th or a yeah, couple hundredths actually, of a second. I think yeah. I remember that they asked to see a photo of the finish. Mm -hmm. Asked to get a picture of it. Yeah, and the kid had kid had big teeth, so I think he won. That was Aaron Aaron Egbert. Aaron Egbert. Aaron Egbert. Yep. So the and this is going to get a little off topic, but I uh, met a guy that ran on the relays with him from Minneapolis. He's one of the he's good friends with those the the guys that live down in Kansas City. So I see him every once in a while, and we'll give each other a hard time about those sprint relays. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always gave. So I I went to college with a guy from uh, southern cal his name was matt newland and i gave i mean all so we ended up in that four by two so i had i got i'll say i held my own i got walked run down by a guy from southern cal i handed the baton off to jeremy jeremy went around the 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 third turn and he hit the back stretch and it was, it was like he was shot out of a gun and he walked this kid down from southern cal we went into the the last exchange went into the third exchange ahead by quite a bit and jeremy and chuck had a had a bad handoff and uh so then we came and southern cow was on the inside of us and we came out of the exchange and i think like third and we were in lane four i think they were in lane three and the kid that i went to school with matt newland um i gave him a hard time all the way through uh, college because he had about a two or three meter lead on chuck and chuck ran him down and passed him on the front stretch um so it was it was i don't know it was a good a good story, good thing to give him a hard time about through a, through our, our career at Central. <laughs> what uh, what made your dad so good as as a track coach? Uh, I've said in other episodes, like he just knew how to like in regular season meets, especially like get a point here, get a couple extra points here. He knew who to put with who. Like what what was his thing? I think he paid attention. You know, I always laugh about this, but Dad probably couldn't tell you one of our birthdays. But, uh, and I say that facetiously, 
but he could remember people's splits. He could remember kids' names from other schools. He would know where kids were running, what other teams were going to do. He was really good at putting that stuff together, and he paid attention to it, and he studied it, and it made a difference. I think he got kids to work hard. He, he got he got kids to believe in themselves and and believe in what they're doing, man. He, I mean, I, I look back at just some of the kids that, that you run with even though I was in school, and you don't – and then – when you have it going on when you're in school and then you come back and coach, you don't realize what some of those guys are doing. I mean, we had, I mean, I still remember we have, I, I think of the Rasmussen brothers were offensive guards on our football team. And I go to college and Nate and Aaron and even Mike, they're some of the fastest kids on our football team. And they ran, I mean, I remember Mike running just over two flat halves and a four by eight weighing a 205 pounds. And just, it's just things like that. You, you don't see it very often. They just work the tail off and kids believe in what they're doing. And, um, give him a shot, and he was excellent at that. He was excellent at getting kids to believe in themselves and, and just bust their butt for each other, and it was fun to be a part of. <clears throat> and, and he did a good job of hooking football and track up with one another. Yeah. Of Because you, you'd find kids, a lot of kids are, oh, I don't want to run track. I hate hate running. And it's kind of unspoken rule. Well, do you want to play football? <laughs> oh, so he, he didn't ask. He told, crawl, or see you in a couple months in track. I'm like, yes, sir. Like, there, there was no, would you like to go out for track? It was just be there. So, Boy, we had a lot of kids. They used to call them the weight boys. You yep. know, the guys, that uh, they still came in, and they they did all the, the calisthenics, all the stuff, all the plyometrics, all that stuff beforehand, go to lift. But just the amount of kids that were on the team, it was, it was awesome. Getting involved and, and getting better at what they were doing for everything. I mean – Track make it better for everything. Yep. Yeah. You know, that that was that was one of the things too. You know, with 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 track is you get the weight boys out there, and I mean, you you kind of got everybody together. I mean, going to track meets and stuff kind of became a a fun thing to do. You know, it wasn't fun to go out and run a half. I can't imagine a worse thing in life to. <laughs> well, it's not true. But can't imagine a worse thing to do than hey, let's go run eight hundred meters and how dad always explained it and you just say, well, run a quarter at about 98% and then run another one. <laughs> okay. You know, so, but, but yeah, I think it was just, I mean, there was the impact of having everybody involved with it as well. That was kind of, kind of fun. So, well, who's, who's dad's example he always gave was it one of the Hallett boys that he always said that if you can run a 60 second quarter, you can run a two minute half. <laughs> yeah. I remember him saying that all the time. <laughs> that sounds exactly like dad yeah I, I i can't remember i think it was one of the highlight boys you said if you can run a six if you can run a 60 second quarter you can run a two minute half because they did it I was like well okay <laughs> <laughs> couldn't couldn't quite ever get that done <laughs> uh I was talking, quick. oh sorry go ahead well i was you know we talk about track teams but i think you know i was thinking back to my senior year i think my senior year might be one of the only times we've ever placed in all five relays at the state track meet. Yep. I mean, we had a good group of, I mean, we had just good kids. We had a good freshman class. Like I think Adam Klein, then, you know, Chad Klein, Nick May, and we, we just, we had a good track team. But I think the summer after my senior year is when Tim Dodge moved to Brit. And when Reverend Dodge became the minister at the Methodist I think they church. Actually moved. Didn't they start at the church prior? I think feel like he moved maybe before that, but Tim just finished up the school year. Over uh, was that, Yeah, that very well could have been. But I think Tim yeah. won. I think he won three individual events, set the state record in two of them, and then I mean they got like second or third in the four by two. And I think when he took the baton, they were like everybody else was about fifty meters out in front of him, and he ran about everybody down. Yeah, he was he was okay. Yeah, he was fast. <laughs> I remember he came when he came up to the gym that summer and played basketball, and he was. Duncan and everything else. I'm going, yeah, this kid's all right. <laughs> like it looked like a jackrabbit jumping around the gym, dunking yeah. the ball. Yeah. <laughs> was it Rockwell Swaledale? Is that where he went? Yeah. Yep. Is that what it was? Yeah, Rockwell Swaledale, right? Yeah. There was another, there was another, there's two other schools in there. It was Rockwell Swaledale and then or Sheffield Shape and Rockwell Swaledale. Oh, you're thinking oh, Sheffield Shape back then. It was just Rockwell Swaledale, I think. Then, okay. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, maybe that is. Yep. Now they're West Fork. Yep. Yep. So, uh, who would win a foot race between the four of you? Me. <laughs> Not me. Wait, are we talking now or in our prime? Both. 
In your prime, who's got it? Who was the fastest? I would vote on Jeff. He Look at Jeff fast. smiling. Jeff smiling. Look at him there. He thinks he's he thinks he's got it. Does it count when you only weigh 150 pounds? It's cheating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, he probably we'd have, probably have to go with Jeff. But now, Dan, I don't know. It'd be up for grabs and who could win a hot dog eating contest now. <laughs> we may we may have a real good competition. I might know, be I'd Mark a good go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, real quick here, Coach Haugie. What can you say about Coach Haugie? Because he was your dad's right hand man for a lot of years during track season. I did a podcast with him. It was a good one. But what can you guys say about Coach? He's tremendously loyal and a great asset for Dad and our program and our school and our community. Um, he was uh, fantastic, and Dad yeah. leaned on him a lot to do stuff that he didn't want to do, wasn't very good at, and uh, he was a great asset for our program. Yeah, I think I mean, Mr. Howard is one of the people that – go ahead, Rick. I was going to say, I mean, organizing things. I remember at the meet with the the, the timesheets, you know, him him keeping track of splits, keeping track of everything um, all the time. And we all had him – I mean, all we all had him in class, you know, as in the um, in the egg classes coming through school too. So, yeah, he's, he's great. Sorry, Mark, I interrupted you. No, I'd say Mr. Hoggy was the king of doing the things that, that people never got to see. You know, taking care of the things that, um, whether dad didn't want to do or, I mean, he, but he got a lot of things done. Um, I just remember that I would go down to state track with those guys and I'd sleep in the room with my dad, Mr. Hauge, and boy, if you got an hour of sleep, you were lucky. Was, oh my God. <laughs> you know, when I was a senior, we stayed in the same room with dad and Hauge, and I don't know how that happened, but me and Matt Bruins, and I agree, I don't know if we got an hour of sleep. <laughs> Sorry, how the windows, yeah, sorry. windows are rattling. <laughs> it was like a competition for the legendary Hall of Fame track coach. He is, and we said, What was his secret for all his success and all these good things? And then it's like, By the way, the night before the biggest race of the year, we're just going to not let you guys sleep at all by putting us all in the same. <laughs> oh, I wasn't competing, I was just long for the ride. So I was just, I was young. <laughs> but no, uh, one thing is, what is you talk about all those stories of track and field and all that. Uh, when I came back and started coaching, obviously uh, my dad and Mr. Hobby were still coaching. So every – now, probably wasn't the healthiest thing we ever did, but every track meet, we would go up to the hob knob after a track meet. We'd get home from the – wherever they were. My, Mr. Hobby, my dad, and myself would go up to the hob knob. Dale would keep that thing open for us. I don't know. There was days I think we got out there 11, 30, 12 at night, on, no matter what day of the week it was. And we'd go up there and, and take turns buying a supper after the meets. And you talk about those stories that are told. But the kicker that – you know, my dad forgot sometimes, even Mr. Howie sometimes, they're nudging and telling me, hey, you remember that one time? Remember that one time and he ran that time, whatever, whatever? And I go, dad, I wasn't even born yet. That was in the 70s. <laughs> but they're always asking me, like, I, you remember that? You remember that? No, not at all. I just remember the last time you told me the story. But I tell you what, you learn a lot of history and a lot of that stuff because it's a lot of track knowledge and a lot of memories and a lot of things those guys have done. I mean, those years that Coach Howie and Coach Sanger were together, that's crazy. Um, you don't see that very often anymore. The amount of amount of experiences those guys would have would have had together, but it's awesome because they're full of knowledge. You know, those guys have forgot more things than I know about track, and it's awesome to hear. <clears throat> so, what was Howie's first year? What what would been his first year coaching track? It's like I, I want to say it's like eighty. It's got to be eighty. Oh well, that's not right. I'm thinking it would have been before. Would have been before yeah, thinking, you were in school, Kevin. That guy it had to be about right when. I want to say 85 or 6, somewhere in there. Yeah. I want to say 83, 84, maybe. It might have been a few years before. But he was there a long time. Long time. Long time. Yeah. Because I think of that year, like you go back, sorry, Dan, we kind of digress here again. But I think remember the, some of those first memories I had, too, at Drake Stadium, Kevin, talking about like when Jeff Jeff Nielsen, Mark Hudson, you know, the, John some of the Iceman boys were running um, at Drake Stadium. And then I remember the year, remember the year we were at Ankeny, at the state track meet at Ankeny. Um, I don't know if it's because of renovation or an off weekend or no, something. Just but... moved it. So I think the boys and girls were the same weekend. That's the year like John Wyland won the yep. won the 400 800 back to back, and they were like, gosh, 15 minutes apart. Yep. And the tornado like almost rolled through when we were in Ankeny. Like the weather came through, and yeah. Because I, I think I can't remember, I think how he was there. I think he would have been coaching. He was there. I know he was there when John Wyland was a freshman. Because he talked about, or freshman or sophomore, when John Ryan ran the two mile from the years before. I mentioned how he's the one told me that, just that he was he was young and um, not yeah. that he just he went out fast 
Yeah, that was in like 80, 82 then was when John was probably a freshman because he graduated yeah, so in early 86. So, yeah. I know Mr. Hockey told me that story once, so. Well, and he loved track. I mean, his nephews, you know, just the yep. success that his nephews had in track and just his love of, of you know, watching track for so many years. So Well, yeah. him and John Swenson, he died at the football. Those guys filmed for how long? I mean, the amount yeah. of things that, that he did. I mean, John Swenson's mm-hmm. been doing it since he was done, I think. Yeah. Playing in high school, and yep. then how it helped him out, and when he started as well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, <clears throat> Tyler's doing it with them up there. When I ever Rick and I get back to games, there they are, right there. Yep. So, yep. yep. No. Uh, you never answered my question before we move on to wrestling. Who would win a two hundred meter dash in twenty twenty three? Jeff. Oh, it's a two hundred. I'd probably win, guys. Right. Well, I didn't say hundred. Actually, that might be that might be true. <laughs> I might. Have I doubt it. I don't. might have hit the threshold where if I try and run 200 meters, there's going to be bad things happen. I'm still rehabbing a hammy, so I can't answer that, honestly. <laughs> so it sounds like Kevin is the answer to me. <laughs> yep. I don't, know, I don't know if it's going to be who would win it. It's going to be who would survive it. Who would finish it? Who would finish it? <laughs> <Who'd> finish it? <laughs> so you start with a jog and your chances are pretty good. Yeah. I went for a walk tonight. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Was it more than 200 meters? Yeah. Winner. There you go. All right. Here we go. Moving on to wrestling. Before that, though, uh, thanks to Levi Don Trucking, Eric Crawl with Ag Performance, Swenson's Hardware, speaking of John Swenson, Cattlemen's at the Club in Belmond, Michael Ewing of Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company, and the Showalter family in Window World of Mason City. All right. Wrestling. Uh, Jeff, you can just you can listen in here or chime in. Uh, three wrestlers, Rick, Kevin and Mark. Uh, Kevin, uh, you lettered several times, made it like, to districts a couple times. Rick, you were state runner-up twice, and Mark won a state title in 2001. You got third the year before. Um, let's talk about wrestling a little bit here. Uh, what were those experiences for you guys like with, with Coach DeLeon, Billy, Mark still, I think, kind of involved in the wrestling program today. So uh, what can you say about Britt West Hancock wrestling? Oh, I guess dang. all I would say is we had some just comes up. <laughs> What's ahead. that? I guess all I would say is when I was in school, we had some really, really good wrestlers in our room. At one time, we had three state champs there at one time with Don Finch and Ron and Pat, several place winners. And at the time, we didn't even realize how competitive it was, but uh, certainly some really good wrestlers from the history of our program. Yeah, I mean, it's you look the talk about a rich tradition going back, you know, the early well, I guess the modern era, you know, the early '70s with just how much success there was, you know, with the Higgins, the Stevensons, you know, Howlett's, the the, the you know, all the names, <laughs> the, the some of the Don boys and the um, you know the Cook boys and some of them that had come through. Then you go kind of fast forward as you get into the '80s. You talk about kind of that mid '80s. You're talking about Kevin. Um, with some of the teams and then we had you know my uh my senior year, then we went down there you know four wrestlers um and we had we kind of had maybe we had some success i think my earlier as we went through the earlier uh as kevin was kevin's group and then as we got to my group and then we went down there and you know we had a runner-up finish as a team that year couldn't quite come home with a individual state champ but you know we had chad trollson's the fourth placer and uh and then we had you know, uh, Kerry Meyer and John DeLeon and myself that were runners up. And, you know, we always gave Chad a hard time. He said, you don't, you didn't have to take such a hard road. He lost first round, wrestled us all the way back and, and, uh, and got fourth. Um, so he, uh, and I don't, I think he had every other match or every match was an overtime match, but, uh, yeah, I think there's been, um, you know, and then here as, of, as of late, we went through, you know, quite a few years, I guess we had a lot of state placers, um, and then didn't have any, you know, state champs. A lot, a lot of placers. Um, you know, runner up, runners up. You know, Kerry Meyer was runner up the next year. Paul Jim was runner up a couple years later. Um, and kind of as we went through the years, a lot of placers. And then until we got, um, you know, until Mark. You know, Mark rolled around, got his uh, his uh, third place in his championship, and then and then uh, and then Tate here, you know, a couple years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, there's tell you, a lot of years of a, a lot of good wrestlers and a lot of competitive wrestling in the room at, at West Hancock, Britt and West Hancock. You try to, you try to put into words some of the success that the wrestling program used to have here. And, you know, I say it to our wrestlers every year, I go, you know, 
as good as our football program has been, as good as our track program, as good as any program's been. I mean, we were one of those teams back in the day. I mean, we were, I mean, as good as it gets. You talk about people about what they know about, we would have been Brit at the time and early on was the, was the wrestler. I mean, it was crazy how, I mean, you watch the, the video board up to school. I think there's a time in there you have four guys went to the state title or three guys went to the state tournament, three guys won a state title or state title and come back with a, come back with a trophy. And there's all sorts of those things. And I tell our guys all the time too, and you get tournament time, we go to sectionals. Well, not sectionals anymore, but sectionals district state, what it used to be. Some people you haven't seen at any meets throughout the year. And all, all of a sudden they start coming out, people that just enjoy wrestling. And I tell you what, the, the backing for the wrestling program in this, this community is awesome because I tell you what, people appreciate it. And, and the amount of success that, that the, the program has had is, is unreal. I mean, you talk about some programs that are trying to find their first state title. And, you know, we got, what, 47 of them, right? I miss it. I, I forget it every year what it is. I think 47 is what it is. It's crazy. Thanks, but so. it's, it's awesome. Mark, you say you try to put into words. Well, um, I think that's a perfect time to plug um, the thing I've literally been putting into words for the last year or so, the Brit West Hancock book. Uh, freaking crazy. I thought it would take me a couple months to do that. And I'm on like a year plus right now of trying to put the wrestling program into words. And it is, it's crazy how extensive it is. I knew it was good because I knew the numbers of 47 state champs, but holy cow. Um, there's been more guys place in the top four in our history than people who didn't place at all at the state tournament. It's just, <laughs> it's nuts. So it kind of cracked me up when you said that. I tried to put it into words. I'm like, tell me about yeah. it. It's, it's been a <laughs> challenge. <laughs> well, you, you look at some of that too with uh I, I can't talk for the you know the Kent Townley, the Jim Craig, to those guys obviously way before the coaches, but just some of the stuff Coach Daly owned, um Coach Daly owned did. I mean him and Lois, the the amount of I think of all the online stuff I use for track wrestling and all that to to figure out who's wrestled who, the matches they've done there. They had to they had to have subscribed to every newspaper in Iowa or some of that to to get all that information. But and just to make Kurt Rick, you can you can talk more of with Coach De Leon era, but I, I just I remember I was a manager for a while and he was there, but just the way he was able I don't want to say recruit might not be the right word, but how he was able to push the buttons for people. You know, growing Monday. up I wasn't exactly a real skinny kid. I was, you know, I was a little <laughs> bit of a fat kid growing up. And I still remember going after school to my mom's room every day. And then I would disappear for a little bit. And then she knew where I went because I'd always go down to Coach De Leon's room. Because all I had to do was count to ten in Spanish and I'd get candy every day. And it was like <laughs> And I think he was just working and trying to trying to get me to to, to be a wrestler, which I was going to be anyway. But uh, it's just things yeah. like that that he did. And, you know, the I think they used to call it El Macho, the the elementary tournament, the Lions tournament, some of the stuff that they did. But yep. that that success stuff wasn't just a coincidence. The amount of work that those guys put into it was, was unbelievable. Well, he was a great awesome motivator. Was up to. Yeah, he was a great motivator, Mark. Kind of like what you talked about. Of he would make you believe that you could beat any of them. He would. Number of times he'd say, "Hey, stud, you know, yeah, you know, you can, you can, you can beat this guy. Let's go." And uh, in the practices, it was funny because you go back to guys our age, and, and you know, who had daily own, and um, in the, the practice, he'd have, I mean, just the way he'd organize practices, you know, with the flags, you have the black flag, and you have the different flags that you that you'd come in and come in. You see the black black flag hung up, you're like, "Oh shit, here we go, we got a black flag today." Um, but he was, uh, you know. Lois, he did a really good job of getting the most out of everybody. Yeah, Lois talked about putting ice on the heat thing, where or uh, something where is the heat stayed on the whole time. There was no letting the heat turn off during some practices. I think she said in her podcast with Billy, it's like, oh. like with the thermostat. You mean like with yeah, basically the thermostat, thermostat stick, so the heater would stay on and running no yeah. matter how hot it got. Yeah, yeah. Tell you, those, those old heaters we used to have. Oh man, those were unbelievable. Those things were awesome. I mean, well, I mean, as a coach's standpoint, I'm sure they were, but oh my gosh, I mean, as hot as that thing used to get, can't really do that anymore. Um, well, yeah. to that extent. It was that hot was, in there. It was hot. Yeah. Uh, what about Billy cool. Dalton? I've done a podcast with him, but we talk about Haugie. We talk about Mr. Timmerman, all those guys that maybe don't get the accolades that the head coach gets or the state champion gets, but uh, Billy Dolman's been a staple in the Brit wrestling room for 50 years now. What can you say about Billy? Mark, you can really attest to Billy. Uh, oh, I, I don't know what, I think Billy Dolman will do anything and everything 
pro wrestling program. He's one thing that's been constant. I can't even tell you. It was, I think he went to Waldorf for a couple of years out of college, um, came back shortly after that, was working on the family farm, and and he's been coaching wrestling ever since. And, I mean, the guy that will – I mean, no, I'm not saying anything bad about it. But the guy can't – half the time, he can hardly walk. He's got knees that probably need to replace. He, he's he's wrestled with broken foot – or broken feet. I'm sorry. Bro. A broken foot. <laughs> Your teacher, uh, come on. A torn – I think a torn labrum in his shoulder. He, he's had all sorts of stuff, and – you know, Billy's usually his, his remedy is just tape it up a little bit. Tape it up or don't move it and keep rolling. But Billy do anything and everything for any kid we have. And and he just he, – he loves wrestling. I mean, he has a pure love for the sport. And, and he's just – I mean, it'll make him like Billy. Billy Billy's an awesome dude. And, and, and you can't say enough about him. Even all the assistant coaches that we've had come through these programs and the things that they do, um, and the majority of them don't get paid anything. Um, they do it because they love working with kids and they love the sports they're doing. I mean, it's – we're, we've been blessed in, in our community, that's for sure. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, the assistant coaches and just all the people who've been willing to coach, even in the community to come in, you know, you need to have you need to have buy-in, need to have participation, need to have support, community support and family support and all that kind of stuff for it to be successful. I think that's what, you know, Britt and, and Canada West Hancock over the years has had a lot of that, you know, just a lot of a lot of community and, and support for the school and activities. Well, I could guarantee we'd have 10 or dozens more people that would help coach in the room. Not necessarily. I'm talking wrestling. If they didn't have the rule where you have to pay for the coach. It used to be, you could come in and you could help out and just wrestle. Your room, endorsement, right? yeah. Coach, but now you have to have your endorsement. You have to pay the 500 to 600, whatever it is and all that sort of stuff. And, and you can't do it. But I mean, there's people always, always that want to do it and you know to be honest with you, you have to shoot some of them out because you, get to, um, you don't want to get in, anybody in trouble but uh, yeah. it's just the support's awesome <clears throat> and uh, you guys brought up Lois and stuff too I've talked to Lois a lot lately uh, doing this book uh, she should have been an assistant coach for what she put into that I mean she was Al's you know right next to him doing all the things like we said how he did in track and she knew and remembered everything, like the newspapers, all the scrapbooks. Um, she took care of all the things so Al could focus on on the other things. And um, I was blown away because I never knew Coach DeLeon growing up, but getting to know Lois has been pretty pretty incredible. Thought maybe Al she'd remember something like, no, she remembers everything, and she yeah, did. She's a pretty lot. incredible woman. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Absolutely. I got to live next to him for six, seven years, whatever. Then I moved back to Britain. I was their next door neighbors for however long. And I tell you what, you're right. They still know everything that went on however, umpteen years ago and very proud of it as they should be. <clears throat> Anything else about yep. wrestling? Uh, Mark and I give each other, give each other a hard time. A lot of it, uh, Dan, over the, the, the finishes, you see us both smiling as you got into the wrestling topic. So we've had, we had that conversation a lot. I tell you what, Dan, <laughs> And well, you guys know I've, you know, I wrestled, got third my junior year, won it my senior year. And according to all our friends and all Rick's friends, I still would never beat Rick in a match. Now, I'm calling <laughs> BS on that. I'm not going to accept that. But that's what I got to hear from Coach Hagan. I got to hear from all those guys about that, about Rick would beat me. How about me? Well, there's a lot of head to heads. This is what my comment on wrestling there's a lot of head to heads. In our family, um, I'm still ahead in a match score on Mark just because I was smart enough that as soon as he could start kicking the piss out of me, I quit wrestling him. Um, but Kevin cannot take Rick down ever. It will not happen. What? Ever. You know that's true, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, I don't even what know. If I head him. Him. We were standing in the front yard one day and Kevin was calling out Rick. And he's just like, get over here, let's wrestle. You know, just kind of kidding. All of a sudden, Rick took him, tossed him, ass over apple cart. Kevin's laying on his back. Rick gets up, walks into the house for the next half hour. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Troy, where he's standing out in the front gates yelling Hector, waiting for Hector to come out. I think Kevin took off his shirt, stood in the front yard, and just screamed for Rick to get back out there. <laughs> Rick never came back out because he knew that <laughs> it wasn't going to be a wrestling match. It was going to be a fist fight, but yeah, I've, I've, uh, 
I don't seen, remember that at all. When did that happen? I don't I've never that. seen old Kev fly through the air like that. <laughs> old twinkle toes. Allegedly, I don't recall. Kevin. I don't recall. Allegedly. 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 <laughs> Rick, you remember that, right? Oh, I remember it. Yeah, you bet. I don't know if Mark was old enough to remember it. I think, it was, I think it was the overhook underhook, I think, is where it came I, I do remember that. Mark might have been inside playing video games and eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dew. I don't know. Probably an illegal move. Probably. <laughs> I think I think Kevin said something to the effect of, get out here, I'm not done with you. <laughs> God darn it all the heck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something like that. Good times. Good times. Yeah, oh, good times. <laughs> Did your oh, dad did your dad wrestle in high school? I don't know if I ever heard. Did he do any winter sports or basketball or anything? He's the oh. king of the side roll. He had a great side roll, yeah. He, he's the <laughs> king of side roll, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they I don't because I think his brother Dave, I you guys have to cry. I want to say Dave only wrestled two years in high school. I'm not sure they had it in high school. I don't think they had wrestling when dad was in high school. <laughs> in his in his high school anyway. Right. Um, yeah. Right. I, I'm not sure on that though, but yeah. yeah, and his his brother. Well, Dan, you probably know that his brother, our uncle, Dave, was national champ at Upper Iowa, wrestler. Okay, I don't know. I didn't know that actually. But yeah, so he uh, he won it. I guess his junior. Year. Um, he's in the Hall of Fame at Upper Iowa, a national champ wrestler. His junior, year, and then he got the story goes he got beaten. He got beaten the final his senior year. Um, and I, I don't know if we know the incomplete story, but it was you know he was he was actually trying to pin the guy to help him win like a team title. Um, and, uh, and he ended up losing the match. Uh, mm. So, but yeah, he was, he was a real good wrestler and uh, well, national you champion. At Upper Iowa. You ever go to Upper Iowa, you'll see his, uh, you'll see his picture in the trophy case. He's a mean guy with a flat top. It looks like he means all <laughs> yeah. business. He looks, he looks like a wrestler. Yes, he does. <laughs> <clears throat> along with, along with dad and Denny Brum's picture and, mm. and uh, some of the other Upper Iowa well, all Brand. sorts of Upper Iowa alum that, I mean, that's where, wasn't Mr. Runyon from Upper Iowa? Isn't that where he uh, yeah, Upper Runyon. Iowa graduate? I think so. And I know it's more than just that, too. Hammerman, yep. yep. All right, Jeff, it's your turn. Basketball, uh, who'd win in a one-on-one -on -one game? Any of you for any combination? Well, I think in my lifetime, I have yet to beat Mark in a one-on-one -on -one game. Uh, pretty much become up because I walk away so bruised and battered. I can't. I'm concussed. Um, everything above. I don't know if you remember his. I mean, he talked about was that Third Street, Mark? Yeah. When he lived on Third Street and he had that basketball hoop outside when he lived right next to De Leon's. And I don't know. We were in our thirties. We'd go out there and play one on one. <laughs> and I mean, by the end of the game, Mark didn't even attempt to dribble. He'd just pick up the ball, run to the hoop throw it, throw me, and then rebound the ball and throw it in the hoop. House rules, Jeff. House rules. It's like call Dan, Dan, might have to, Dan might have to re-ask his question. So how about in basketball, Jeff? <laughs> Can anybody beat you in basketball? <laughs> I wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah, I, want, I mean, one-on-one, -on -one, I, I, I'd like to think I would have held my own, but who knows? <laughs> That's probably one of the maddest I ever got was in IMs in college playing Rick's team and Rick was throwing up shots going in. I was so mad. I think I was guarding him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't remember that. Well, I do remember, I do remember our intramural basketball team though, in, in, in college with a bunch of couple teams that were all, all football players out there. That was about, that was pretty much foul fest too, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Didn't you play with Hyde? Wasn't Hyde on your team? We had a good team, but you guys, I think beat us and you were throwing up shots and they were going in. Yeah, I probably made one. <laughs> That's probably what happened. I think you made more than that. That was it. Was fun. <laughs> Jeff, your your senior year, were you guys one game away from state or two? You're close. Uh, I think we were two because we got beat by Saint Ansgar, and then Saint Ansgar went and beat Tri Center Neola, uh, and then Saint Ansgar went on. They actually played in the state finals. I think they got second, uh, but they beat the number one team in the state. They beat Applington, who had Aaron Thomas and Aaron Campman. Uh, and I can't be by Bondurant, didn't they? That sounds right. I mean, they two they those two big, yeah, two big kids, right? With Bondurant, yeah, two yeah. real tall kids, don't they? yeah, yeah. But St. Ansgar, yeah, they were they were good that year. They had a lot of good athletes, and they had that Hanum kid who ended up going and playing tight end for the Seahawks. Uh, mm -hmm. They they had some. They had a Luke Porsche kid that went and played uh, played football at the Air Force Academy. 
Um, didn't you go? Didn't you go to college with one? Was Will Fossey one of them too? Will Fossey was one of them. I think he blocked my shot five times when we played against uh, <laughs> St. Ansgar. So you should jump higher. I tried. I really did try, <laughs> but we're man, we were we were close. I mean, we we were. If you look at us as a basketball team, I mean, we were we we're pretty good. You know, we had Ritima and Evans, who both were six five and pretty pretty athletic. Chad Klein was just a workhorse on defense and Nick Drake could, you know, that was kind of before, you know, you didn't really have the, all kinds of shooters like you have now, but Nick Drake could, could fill up the basket in a hurry. So, I mean, I had a lot of fun playing high school basketball and we had a, we had a good team. So obviously that makes a difference. And, you know, my senior year, if I could make a layup, we'd have outright won the conference championship uh, with, with some, pretty darn good teams that were in it. You know, Lake Mills had Andy Stendrude and Mark Van Gorkum, you know, that's six, nine and six, seven. And, uh, so how, yeah, long was, how, long, how long after the state championship did you play for city that year? You got, I remember at home, you got beat on a buzzer beater at our home gym, like what a week and a half after the state championship or two weeks after the state championship. The uh, football? Um, I don't know. I don't remember getting beat by four. So we got, we got, drilled by lake mills pretty good mm -hmm. but i mean i think we practiced i think we had four or five practices and we went over and played emmitsburg over there i can remember doing that and i mean we when we got into the conference i think we lost our first two or three conference games so i think we did i think mm -hmm. we did get beat by four city and lake mills pretty sure a buzzer beater I, 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 I can remember i got dunked on like six times in that game stunger just hung on the rim the whole game uh, Mark Van Gorkum hung on the rim the whole game. Uh, and I can remember we loaded hogs out that morning. So, like, I smelled like big shit. <laughs> shit. Uh, I can just remember just playing the game and Lake Mills kids are like, what is that? Like, I don't know. Those brick kids. <laughs> so, but and yeah. Then you, was, beat all, you beat both those teams, though, right? Then, then it's well, I cycle think, back I think the counters. the so then Osage was really good too. So we went up and played Osage and I think we ended up beating them by 15, 20 points. And from that point on, I mean, I think we rolled everybody pretty good in the conference. The team that we always struggled with was Northwood. I mean, we just, and we played them as our final conference game and we had to beat them to win the outright title. And I was standing underneath a hoop. I didn't, and Joe Iceman had the ball. He was driving to the basket. I didn't think there was any way he was going to be able to get me the ball. And he did. And I caught it and I threw it up and I air banked it. I mean, I threw it off the backboard and I think it landed about the free throw line because I was just trying to get it up because the 6'6 six, six kid was coming to hammer me. I don't know if there's ever been anybody who had their shot blocked in the game of high school basketball more than me. I bet I got rejected 500 times. You gotta have goals. Gotta have the game I remember, the game I remember, Jeff, was that Lake Mills though. Because the second time, did you did you guys play Lake Mills then in tournaments, or was that the conference game? Yeah, we we played Lake Mills. Oh. We had to play them again in tournaments too. Because yeah, uh, I got a good story about that. If that and Dad, when we get to it, but yeah, that's the game I remember being in. You guys and you rolled them pretty good in that game. You guys won pretty big in that one, didn't you? Yeah, we rolled them pretty good. So. Yeah. But that was the game. I think we played that up at Lake Mills again too. Yep. And uh, I mean, they had a they had a kid that was just a punk. I mean, he was a punk in football. Uh, you know, I can still get the film out, and I can show you clips of him being a punk. I won't put his name on here or anything like that. But he was a punk. But I mean, we went at it in basketball too. We didn't really go at it in football because he sucked. Uh, he just <laughs> got he got rolled. Um. I can't remember what happened. We were kind of tangled up for a rebound and I went up and got it and put the ball back up in the hoop. And when I landed, I think I allegedly threw him to the ground and they didn't call a foul. But then when I came down, I kind of landed on him because he had fallen and then he, he started trying to kick me. And so I looked down at him and I can't remember if I stepped over him, stepped on him or what I did, but then I kind of, I yelled something at him and I think the, official heard it and I would I thought I was going to get teed up so then after the game you know and I I was backing down the court and he was running at me and he was yelling something and I was yelling stuff back and so after the game you know what you know that stuff happens everybody's a competitor but after the game dad comes up and kind of tugs me on the shirt 
And he kind of goes, what was that all about? You know, I was kind of like, you know, you know, and all this. And then Mark comes up and goes, I know what he said, Dad. I know what he said. And so Mark proceeded to go through all the lines that I was saying to that kid. And they weren't very, they weren't very nice. And uh, I think Mark yeah. flat out told Dad, he goes, you know, the last time, he goes, Dad, yeah, Jeff, Jeff said the middle finger to him. <laughs> He was telling him good nice game. Enough. Yeah, good game. So I, I remember that because I was trying to backpedal away from dad and get out of that conversation because, you know, I'm I'm pretty sure he knew what was going on and what was happening. But Mark was Mark was really willing to step in and, and fill in the details of that whole interaction. So Mark wanted to clear and Mark wanted to clear things up. He wanted to make yeah, sure all, everyone was I'm all about clear communication, Jeff. <laughs> I think Mark had a Mountain Dew and a hot dog in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't bet against this. <laughs> but no, I mean, yeah, that was uh basketball's yeah, I can legitimately say that I basketball was was fun. And I came through with a good group and you know, we all came up together. Uh, you know, it's Ron Iceman, Wayne Klein, Jim Thompson, you know, those guys took us around to play basketball tournaments and you know, yeah. growing up I can remember, you know, we went to some tournament and we played Clear Lakes A team and you know, we ended up beating them, and and uh, so it was just uh, it was a fun experience. So, and having yeah. Sickles as my eighth grade coach, I remember a lot about that. I mean, I really enjoyed playing for him in in eighth grade basketball, and that was kind of the I don't know if it was the launching point, if I'd say that, because I was always kind of geared towards basketball. Because I mean, wrestling was a lot of work, and uh, you got tired doing it, so. Aren't you going to tell everybody your, your junior high record in wrestling? Oh, I mean, oh boy. I mean, you want me to tell them? Okay, I'll, I'll tell them. So, so, I, you know, Dan, I wrestled, I think I weighed in at, I don't know, 89 or 93 pounds or something my seventh grade year. Didn't have a match, so I was sitting on the end of the bench, you know, just kind of minding my own business and Coach Potza comes up and says, hey, Jeff, we got a match for you. So I'm like, okay. You know, I go run my sprints, uh, get ready for the match, get a good <laughs> fight going, come out to the mat. You know, I'm wrestling. I think I wrestled a kid that weighed 130 pounds. I mean, this guy looked like He-Man. I mean, he was like from Legend. Vision. This guy, he was like from Vision Quest. What's that guy's name? Shoot. Shoot. He was like, shoot. <laughs> so anyway, he – uh <laughs> He stuck me. And then Dan, I was so upset. I went, I proceeded to win 28 matches in a row. <laughs> 28 and one. 28 and one. <laughs> I was really hopeful you're going to say that was your last match because then you and I would have identical wrestling records of 0 and 1. But shoot. <laughs> no, that was not my that was not my last match. That was my very first one. So how would have Jeff done in high school if he wrestled? What do you guys think? <laughs> You've done just fine. <laughs> Even they will never know. They will never know. That's right. <laughs> Who, who's winning in the Hobo Day wrestling matches on Hobo Golf Day? Are you any of those anymore? Ooh. Been I'm a few years of those anymore. Those are dangerous. It's not there wrestling is... match. It's always dollar takedowns. <laughs> yes, it's always takedowns normally. And it's been <laughs> several years since we've done takedowns at Hobo Days. <laughs> <laughs> We could do a podcast just on hobo golf and hobo days itself, but that, so yeah. Right, I'm gonna get a few sponsors, and we're gonna talk some football. Uh, Kelly Real Estate, Farmers Trust and Savings Bank, Advanced Door Systems in Forest City, Miller and Son Golf Cars, the Brit Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Cruises, and First State Banker. Rounding off my 19 sponsors for tonight. Uh, you guys all played football, right, in high school? You all <laughs> participated, okay. Uh, obviously coached by your dad. That was my attempt at humor. Not very good. Uh, we all know your dad's accolades, three championships, four runner-ups, 30 playoff appearances, I believe 19 district or conference titles. Um, but I did a little breakdown between the four of you. Uh, there is one year where Kevin and Rick, uh, it was Kevin's senior year and Rick's freshman year. So some of the numbers might be a little skewed, but Rick was already upset with me about the win-loss record. Rick, can you explain why you didn't like that? Yeah, because I had the least wins. 
that was in my in my career. I think you should probably give give a couple of those when Ke for Kevin's. Throw those other my way, will you? And then take yeah. a couple away from him. You do I think that? Jeff, Jeff could stand to give up a few wins. He's got they could. There. Well, I just figured the ones from Kevin's senior year, maybe you could just throw those my way and just take them away from him because I hey, that was you know we we're kind of there. Swings <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Kevin went thirty-eight and seven in his career. Rick was twenty-nine and eight. Jeff was forty-four and four, and Mark was thirty-three and nine for a combined one hundred and forty-four wins to only twenty-eight losses between the four of you in football. Uh, let me see. Kevin won two titles and runner-ups in the conference and district. Uh, Rick won two and two. Jeff won uh, a district title all four years, and Mark, you were runner-up all four years. You were the in those Emmitsburg years in the 2A football before we started dropping down to 1A and A. Uh, just in general, uh, in playoffs also, uh, Kevin, you were runner-up twice, semis, quarters. Rick, first round twice, semis once, missed the playoffs once. Uh, Jeff, runner-up, quarters, semis, state champs your senior year. And Mark semis missed the playoffs, first round quarterfinals. Uh, so a lot of a lot of trips to the semifinals and beyond. Uh, just in general, what can you guys say about your time playing football for your dad and Coach Perkins and all the other assistant coaches? I would just say a lot of great memories, a lot of great people, a lot of lasting friendships, uh, things I'll remember for the rest of my life. Um, and I think kind of what uh, Mark was saying earlier, you know, I think – it was instilled in us, our teams, our teammates, just to work hard and have fun. And I think that's probably the lasting impression I'll have of our program is I think that if we do that and nothing else, we're going to be pretty proud of it. And I am. Um, and it was fun to play with Rick. I wish we could have played more together. Um, but uh, like I said, just a lot of really, really awesome memories. It was fun. Even this year down at the state, uh, State finals, several of the guys that I played with were there. Um, just good to talk to them, and um, I'll cherish those friendships forever. Yeah, I think uh, it's something that you really don't appreciate it. Um, and you, Dan, you and I have talked about this, you know, in, in the past of you don't, I guess, really look back and appreciate it and understand it until maybe you've gone, you know, you've you've got out of high school, you've got gotten down the road a few years and, and are able to look back on it. Um, to kind of start to understand, I think, you know, what, what some of those experiences were like, you know, Kevin and I getting to play together was, was awesome. You know, he was, he was uh, his senior year. You know, he was kind of, I mean, he was the leader of the team, you know, everybody looked up to him and I'm coming in in this little lowly freshman trying to, trying to contribute something, but it was, it was one of the funnest years of, of football. Um, I can, I can ever remember in the whole run to the semifinals when we lost, you know, we lost what three regular season games, Kevin, and then, uh, and then made our run or two. two regular season games, I guess. And then made the run through the playoffs. Um, it was, we got it was a lot just, better that year. That was what was so yep. fun. We got a lot better. And that was just, just a great memory. Improved yeah, a great memory. Remember Ned, Brian Ned, been picking off that ball against Akron Westfield, yeah, running it back did. the other way, and yeah, the fumble. And I mean, just yeah, a lot of those things that uh, a lot of memories from those years that that are great. Is that the and, fourteen to nothing win against Garner? That was, oh, that was a year, yeah. That, that was, was a that was like, year. That might yeah. be the the game that I've heard brought up the most in growing up. Fourteen nothing win against Garner that year. Yeah, yep. yep. that but was yeah, an electric just, atmosphere that night. There's a lot of people there, and I don't think many people gave us much of a chance to win that one. Garner was very good that year, and so were we. Yeah, but then so, so many years, just kind of establishing a. You know, the program, the friendships, the relationships. Again, you go back to all the support um, from the community and the people that that want to participate. And I look, I even think about that now with, you know, the memories that we had coming up once that, you know, through the program and everybody's always asked, what's it like having your dad as a coach? And at the time, I mean, the answer is always like, I mean, I don't know. We don't know any different. He was our coach, you know, the, all the way through as we were growing up. Um, so we didn't really know any different until we, you know, kind of got out of it and got into college and, and down the road. But it was we were really fortunate, you know, us four growing up um, with our parents as teachers and coaches. And we basically lived at the school, lived uh, at all these different activities and events. And it was a pretty, uh, pretty special. Um, and I even like our, like even now, what's our, I don't know what our, like our ratio is, you know, our, we're a small class A school and we still have 
good, I mean, very solid numbers as far as boys that play football, right? As far as the numbers of, of kids that are in school that play football. I mean, just look at that as, as rural communities continue to have lower and lower numbers. And we, we easily, we easily have 11 man football, right? We easily can put a, put a, a team on the field in 11 man football. And there's so many of these other schools that they can't even hardly get enough participation to do it. And that's, you know, again, kind of goes back to the, the tradition, the support, and all that, 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 you know, goes into the program and programs. It's, it's important to people. Dad used to always say that, you know, he goes, yeah, people can get upset or concerned or not like something, but that means they care. And that's a really, really important thing when you try to have a program and people care. That's a really important aspect to having a good program. You know, Rick, you said you didn't really notice it or appreciate it at the time. And I, I look like at our live stream right now, Jay and Kevin, you know, broadcasting the games. Five to 8,000 people sometimes watching one of those games. So like, yeah, and the, and the stands are still pretty full too, but it's people from out of town, out of state that are 20, 30, 40 years out of, you know, being in high school that tune in every single week. So I think kids nowadays, I would like to help some of them understand maybe just how big of a deal it is to some people. And uh, maybe, I don't know, that trip you and I made to Hartley last fall really uh, was <laughs> like, holy cow, that took yeah. forever to get there and forever to get back. But I was like, I went, uh, wanted to spend my Friday night any differently than going to a game um, yeah. as much as I can get to a game. So just like you like you said, Kevin, by your dad, just people care. And it, it's a big deal still. So, yeah. Uh, should we get to the state championship of 1996 here soon? It looks like Jeff's just itching to <laughs> rub it in. Hey, anytime you want to get to it, Dan, I'm I'm fine. We can <laughs> we can we can chat as long as you want. I think I just saw Jeff kind of sit up in his chair a little bit like this and maybe stick his chest out a little bit. Huh? Well, that's, you know, that's me trying to support this new beefier frame I've built. <laughs> Dan, you, you say that that. I just I can't believe that somehow Al DeWar doesn't have a way to technologically patch himself in. He was waiting for you to say something about 1996 state championship and somehow <laughs> get himself in here with his with his picture on this thing. He heard you say 1996 and he his ears yeah perked up. He knew something was talking about that year. Oh. But honestly, like you, you know, looking back at your dad, like you know, there was that like curse of the dome for a long time. And I know that bugged him, but then, you know, Jeff's senior year, they kind of busted through that. And um, a 10 year old me, a big deal when uh, our guys went in a state championship. So um, you guys were kind of our, our idols back in the day when I was getting through elementary school. So um, still remember a lot about that year. Uh, what that mean to you, Jeff? I know we talked in the 96 episode, you wouldn't get to win a title with your dad. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, you, you say it's special, and you can say all sorts of things that that wrap it and explain it the best you can in words. But um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's pretty special. You know, we I grew up around Coach Perkins. Obviously, I grew up around Dad. You know, uh, I can still remember in 1993 when we got beat in the state finals. You know, we're ahead 20 to nothing at halftime, uh, and end up losing 21 to 20. Uh, you know, I can remember sitting at the kitchen counter and watching dad walk in the front door, you know, put his hands on the counter, put his head down, look up, shake his head, go sit on the couch. You know, I, I can remember those things. So, so to be part of the one where, you know, after the game, you can kind of go up and give him a hug and say, you know, dad, we got it done. Uh, you know, that's a pretty special thing. And, and, you know, I always kind of chuckle because I think it was the, the Sunday of the state title game where we were sitting at home on the the couch and dad was watching the film of the game, uh, you know, and I walk in the door. I, I don't think I've ever seen the full version of the state title game. Um, might be the only game that I've never seen, but, you know, I can remember dad looking up at me and going, we still won, right? Because, you know, I think there was frustration on his part because he didn't think we played very well, you know, and so that always kind of makes me – me chuckle a little bit and that's you know for still following West Hancock football I think that's something that's been fun to watch the last few years and and you know not to take anything away from any of the other teams but I think that's one of the special things about that 
21 team is, you know, I think that team, you know, they got down to the dome that second half against East Buck, East Buck that finals game against Grundy Center. You know, I think those guys laid it on the line and, and they played about as well as, uh, you know, a football team for what they were capable of playing. And I, you know, I thought that was a pretty special thing. And, and that's kind of the curse of the dome and what it comes down to for me is I don't know that we've ever gone down there and played our best football. Uh, so that was kind of exciting and um, not to get on a tangent, but yeah, 96 was, was pretty special. And to go through that with dad, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, growing up, having dad as a coach, we didn't, we didn't know it any other way. Um, but you know, that going through the process of, of winning a state title uh, and having your dad as a the head coach, I think that puts a pretty, um, you know, special twist to it. And, and obviously it was, it was pretty neat. So. He's not fun to be around when he loses. <laughs> I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of, I mean, you remember, it's kind of like we've talked about too, Dan, you, you ice. There's so many big wins. I mean, you look back over those, over the years of how many big wins there have been, but it's like, you always remember those, the losses. I mean, yes. You always remember those tight losses, those big losses. Gosh. I So Gabe Mitchell, Gabe Mitchell lives down here in Waukee and, and his stepdaughter and, and my daughter played on a volleyball team together. And just this weekend, we were we're sitting at a volleyball tournament and Gabe and and Steph Aries there from she came down from Waverly. Her daughter was playing in a in a in a volleyball tournament. And we go back and so we, it was funny. We sit in this little group and we have four Brit people sitting right there. Danielle was sitting beside me, Gabe was sitting here, and and Steph walks by, and all of a sudden we start talking all, you know, all this the of uh, this Brit stuff. And we go back to the Gosh, I think it was the O, would have been the O. He graduated O three, 3 right, Mark? Two years behind you, I think, is what yep. Gabe was. You're talking about would have been Dyke New Hartford 02. 2002? I'm going to the Dyke New Hartford yeah. O two 2 game, man. I was on and the I think it was a quarterfinal, quarterfinal game, right, with the, the tip fourth and 16. 25 or something, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, tip pass that, that they caught and then went down and scored. And and he's, yeah, we're just sitting there talking about it, and he's like, man, you know, uh, just remember that play and – and uh, and along that lines, you not not get too much off on too much of a tangent, but his uh, his son goes to Dowling and is going to go to to Dowling, and um, he was had some of those players over at his house evidently, and he said he was sitting back and listening, and they're talking about man, there's this team West Hancock small school, and kind of in the context of the fact that they throw the ball all over, right? I mean they they got the spread offense, uh, the four quick. In the, in the gun and they're they're slinging the ball all over the place and the players are talking about man there's this team west hancock they put up huge numbers and they and they run the ball because we need to do some of that he's he was telling me he's sitting back in the corner just kind of no nah, shaking his head listening to the conversation <laughs> eating it up you know get the old vhs tapes out yeah there you go yeah there you go but yeah. <laughs> some of Pivot down to Mark then a little bit. You're obviously the head coach right now. Took a, a co-head with your dad that last year, and now you obviously had a lot of success. Uh, what's it mean to you to to continue doing what your dad started, 1968? Hey, it's it's special, you know. Did uh, football in general is just it's such a it's a great sport, the ultimate team sport. So many people involved, not just the kids playing, but the community members behind it, the coaching staff, the amount of people that have coached here. Um, and then that, and you know, the majority of them all played for uh, dad and, and Gene and or coach Perkins. And it, it's just, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool deal. And, you know, I think it'd be like, you guys can understand it kind of fell into something that was on some pretty good football teams. When I, when I started being the, the head coach, I mean, the, the success some of these guys have had and some of the stuff, it's, it's been a pretty special group of kids. I think you were referencing Rick with the, some of those, those teams in the, little kids football earlier you're talking about when yep. they play in the championship game and that's kind of where some of these kids we got coming through is where that all started and you're seeing some of those those benefits of uh those guys coming through but it's just to to be able to coach something that has so much backing and, and so much support from the community from the parents and from the kids i mean the kids want to play the kids get excited about it i mean that's that's fun to be a part of when you get kids that want to be there and want to do the things and want to get better and want to be successful it's you know, it's usually a recipe for success and that's what it's been thus far. And, you know, it's, 
it's pretty cool. And, you know, you always, you got something that, that my family's put a lot of time into and along with a lot of other families, but you want to, you want to keep it going. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty special deal. I don't really know how else to talk about it. I mean, it, there's nothing better than a locker room on a Friday night after a win. In my mind, there's nothing better than a Friday night football game. Friday nights are pretty special in general. It's just, there's nothing else like it. It's the, the lead up from the week is so scheduled from Monday through Friday. And then you get to the Friday night game and you, you're able to come out with a win. You can celebrate it with your team in the locker room, coaches and, and teammates. And, and to be a part of that's pretty special. I think any, any, anybody that's played, anybody would tell you that, that just the, the work that goes into it and to be successful on, on those game nights and be able to enjoy that with, with uh, the players and the families and, and things like that's pretty awesome. There, there's nothing like it in my mind. Yeah, I, uh, I was at the school, what was that, two weeks ago now, Mark, grabbing some more wrestling files yeah. from you, which my wife has pointed out to me or taking up three-fourths of one of our bedrooms right now. <laughs> uh, but I, I was in there in the gym while he was teaching PE, and a couple of kids called him Coach Sanger and so, you know, Mr. Sanger, and it was like, it was almost weird for a minute because growing up, Coach Sanger was, you know, Coach Bob Sanger, and it's it was weird, but it was also, like, really neat to see that, like, that, that we got that next generation going um, with you there and um, keeping things going. So I, I kind of thought about that for a little bit. I was like, that was weird for a minute. Cause I was like, when I hear coach Sanger, I still think Bob. And, oh, well, it's and still, then it's still what it is. It's yeah, yeah. It's cool that now these kids have another, it's just continuing. It's great. So I tell you what, not much has changed. Coach Perkins and coach Sanger have done, you know, the old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And, you know, we've maybe thrown some wrinkles in here and there, but Coach Iceman, Coach Johnson, and everybody else down the line, Coach Francis and everybody else that coaches, I mean, you do an excellent job. And hopefully we can keep it rolling. You know, uh, I got to say this. Uh, uh, in the fall of 2018, Dad had just started his chemo treatment. And he, he, he Mom, and I traveled out to Hinton and to Akron to those games. And – we sat up on the hill and it's probably one of the most enjoyable games I watched. Cause me and dad and mom sat in the car. Mom might've went down to the sideline, I think, but dad sat there and just talked through the game. And one of the things that he is so proud of is the number of coaches that have been involved with the program that played for us, played for West Hancock. And he just went on and on and on. And even on the ride home, gosh, he didn't even shut up. I mean, I was driving. I'm glad he just kept me awake, but he just talked nonstop. He was going through all the kids talking about the linemen and the backs and the coaches. And it was a f fun trip just to hear what he talked about. And I mean, he was just beaming with pride. I mean, he could have been disappointed because he, the circumstances or what he wasn't able to be there, but boy, he was sure proud of what the team was doing and the coaches that are involved. And um, I'll never forget it. It was pretty cool. I uh, I put some stats together here, guys. Um, season rushing yards between the four of you. Mark. Oh, boy, here we go. Away, <laughs> and, and here we go. 1,863 in 2000. And then Rick got 1,334 one year. And then it goes Jeff 910, Rick 891, Rick 551, Jeff 502. And then I said Kevin got a lot of one-yard QB sneak touchdowns as a quarterback and his dad being the offensive Those yards have to be way off, Dan. That's no way that's right. Kevin had 10-yard quarterback sneaks for touchdowns. What are you yeah. talking about? Uh, that yards. probably is very erroneous because we get close and then they call a quarterback sneak. It's almost <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> It was in the record book and now the book doing all the research. I was like, geez, one yard, Kevin Sanger touchdown run. One yard, Kevin Sanger touchdown run. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to include you in there somehow. Uh, you know. And then uh, to add to that, career rushing yards, Rick, 2,776, good for eighth place all time. Mark, 2,241, good for 12th all time. Jeff, 1,435, good for 27th all-time. And Kevin, again, quarterback, 431. Um, and I was surprised that you didn't have 431 rushing touchdowns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Ke Kevin got a little fullback. Kevin got a little fullback in there for about – A little bit, not very much. Five plays. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And then tackles, uh, Kevin, 158, Rick, 172, Jeff, 263, and Mark, 327. Um, Nick Horseman is the all-time leader in tackles, and he always said that a couple of the stat girls didn't really know what they were doing, so they just gave it to him a lot of the time, uh, <laughs> which I'm like, you still got a ton of tackles, Nick, but you guys, 920 tackles, and I would guess that they're all legit tackles. There was no uh, pay. That's probably true for Mark as well, then, right? Was that probably true for Mark? They probably just gave him by default. I wasn't trying to say that just out front. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Who? Who? Uh, who and you guys? None of you are going to say you were. I know that. I know you guys and any other person I've had on this podcast. But um, talking about like specific football abilities, tackles, or running the ball, or whatever. Who would you say maybe did it the best or was you know more well known for one thing or another? You're not obviously gonna toot your own horns here, but who would you say stands out to you guys between the four of you as you know the leader in this category or this category? You know what I'll say something here as the youngest guy. I gotta watch all these guys play football. And you know, I'd, I'd whether I wanted to or not, I had to go to more football games and I would say that I wanted to. When you're growing up five or six years old, you gotta go to another football game. Sometimes it's like, oh my God. Can we do something else? But um, <laughs> anyways, I mean, Kevin, I, in all the things you're talking about, you know, Kevin kind of blazed the path for us in high school and in, in college. He really did. And if I were to say this is going to be corny of, of how I'm going to say all this, but to me, Kevin's the, the best leader that I saw um, going through with some of the stuff he did and the way that he could control a team. But anything he did, people take notice. But Kevin was doing that. I would say as, as a, a physical ability as a linebacker if we're talking defense I think Rick was the guy as far as linebacker but if I talk about a person that can read a defense that knows what's going on in a football game as a defensive I would say Jeff that's how I would rank those three guys and and I just the being able to watch those guys and things they did um it's pretty amazing as a younger brother because um it makes things pretty easy when you're coming through but I'd say it's not very often that you hear people talk about a coach's kid or a coach can't talk about his own kids. Um, I'll talk about them. With those guys growing up as, as three brothers, they were pretty goddamn good football players. And I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill anytime um, <laughs> because I tell you, um, it's tough sometimes as a coach's son doing some things and people don't realize. But uh, I don't think there's any arguing what those guys did. And, and if anybody wants to argue what they did on a football field, um, excuse my language, but those people are full of shit. <laughs> so, uh, but – I tell you what, they're pretty doggone good, but that's how I'd see it. And that's just my opinion. Wow, Mark. So I'll say it from the other perspective. So when I was – I went off to college. I went through high school. Rick was a freshman. Then I went to college. I missed a lot of their high school stuff and their athletics just because I was gone to school. But then, uh, obviously, each of them went to Central, and it was fun for me just to be able to be a part of their college careers – and really see everything that they did, football and, and track. And it's kind of a cool perspective because um, you're surrounded by a lot of really good athletes. Uh, but I think that even fostered um, the things that we talked about earlier here, just with trying to work at something and being around people that are fun to be around and, and building a team. And um, that was a very enjoyable environment for me when I played and it was even it might even have been more enjoyable when I had a chance to coach and then to see these guys be a part of that and we had some really really good teams that we were a part of at Central um, both in football and in track and it was an awesome experience and I, I wouldn't trade that for the world and you know I kind of joked earlier I wish me and Rick could have played together more um, been closer in age but that's kind of how it works out but uh, you know I, I really came out on the good end of the stick with the experiences I was able to have with them in college and uh, to be a part of them as far as the coaching staff and that kind of stuff. So I did appreciate that. Yeah. the Mark kind of alluded, talked about Kevin blaze in the trail. You know, I came, I guess when I got, to, I got through school and got to my senior year, you know, you kind of go on the whole visit thing to other schools and check other places out. And I don't know if it was ever, if I ever really, all that seriously considered anywhere else when visited a bunch of schools, you know, talked to a lot of coaches, but central was kind of, I don't know, kind of the foregone conclusion. And uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome kind of following Kevin through that, that trail that he blazed um, and, and going through, you know, it was very, a lot of similarities 
from our experience growing up and, and having dad as a coach um, at West Hancock and Britt and West Hancock and then having coach Skipper, you know, as we, as we went through, um, we start kind of started that, that journey through central, you know, and then coach, uh, you know, Rich Cack um, and, and Mac now, you know, that's, that's there, you know, it, it's been very similar programs, you know, that, that we kind of phase through. And it's kind of funny. You think one of us were playing down there. I mean, high school, but one of us were playing down central 15 out of 16 seasons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a, a long time that, uh, and the only only season that we missed really was the one between Jeff and I, that uh, when he was a senior and I was out one year, and uh, yeah, a lot of road so, trips for mom and dad. Oh man, yeah, they a lot of, miss lot, much. Of, lot of miles. No, and, and uh, you la- you talk about that. Yeah, you kind of I guess circling back around to Dan to ask what <laughs> what the different people were good at and commenting on these guys. I I echo what Mark said a hundred percent with Kevin. I just remember him just as a leader on the field. Um, kind of putting the team on his back and carrying that. And that was, that was a, a huge thing that I remembered that when I was a freshman, that senior year, his senior year, as we kind of made that run through the playoffs and all the, all the plays he had. And, and, you know, there's definitely some senior, other seniors on that team that were, that were leaders, you know, Byers, Nedvid, Jerdy, you know, a lot of those guys, but um, it was, it was fun to kind of be part of that group and, and be able to experience it with them. And then we get to, as we go through, uh, you know, high school and into the central, I laugh when Jeff came into Central because he was like, I don't know, 180 pounds, dripping wet, whatever you were when you when you got to Central, and you know he he gets uh, there's some injuries on Central's football team, and there's this little pencil neck freshman steps in there and and uh, plays linebacker and is making tackles all over the place, <laughs> like as Mark kind of said. You know, he's he's reading the ball, making tackles, getting there, and ends up he was first team all conference as a 180 pound linebacker, you know, freshman. And that still uh, holds the, though, was it the freshman, freshman tackle record, record that was in his coaching bio for every year that I can remember? Yeah, that's so 10 pounds less than he weighs now. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And then by the time, I mean, Mark and, and Mark coming out of high school, it wasn't, uh, I mean, Mark was a little bigger, right? I mean, Mark kind of had all the tools. He was just the shortest um, as he was, as he was <laughs> coming out of high school. But I mean, once, uh, you know, once he got down there to central, I think by, I don't want to say it was, there was no surprises he knew what he, that he was going to be a great player. Um, and, you know, he had a, he had a great career down there at central as well. Um, but he, you know, he didn't, uh, we used to always, I can't remember. We asked, had that question asked, I want to say it was Bob Fenske maybe years ago that oh, asked wow. us that question. And, and, uh, we went, I can't, you know, we said Kevin was the, was the kind of the similar answer, I feel like. And, uh, you know, Jeff was the fastest. Kevin was the, you know, the, the, the hitter and the, and the, and the leader. And Mark was the best all around athlete. So kind of, we kind of cycled back uh, um, and answered the, the question that way. But I tell you what, it's been, I kind of fell in the middle, followed Kevin through and got to watch him play, play a little bit with him. And then once I got out, I got to watch, you know, Jeff and Mark both go through a lot of their athletic careers, you know, once I was, once I was out of, out of college and, and uh, that was awesome being able to, you know, go to all of those games, um, kind of watch their careers uh, as they went through. And it was, that was a lot of fun. Jeff, Jeff kind of pissed me off a little bit his senior year because I go to football games and I'd, I think one of them was I'd pull in, I'm driving up and it's already seven, nothing. And the game's already started. I haven't gotten there yet. Pull in the parking lot, park the car, it's 14 nothing. By the time I get up to the gate, it's 21 nothing. I get in, it's 28 nothing. I was like, well, I don't know. I might as well just turn around and drive back home, I guess. You we'll remember when we, we drove up to the Lake Mills game? You remember that to the first yep. game? We yep. probably drove 90 mile an hour. Might have been from Pella, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah we had been, to drive, we drove all the way to Lake Mills and we get there and the game had started. And I don't know how we got there in time, but we got pretty close. But that was a score fest. That was a fun game. 76 to 28. Yeah. Yeah. We drove yeah. home that night. And the guys on the radio, the Iowa scoreboard, were talking and they go, and it was one versus three, I think it was at that time. And the guys, I remember the guys saying, look at this. This team, this team, number one versus number three, Lake Mills scored 28 points, and they're two points away from getting 50 pointed. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> hey, Rick. Um, I don't remember that Bob Fenske comment going that way. 
If I remember you correctly, remember, when, when Bob Fenske asked, I believe you told him I was going to be a lineman. <laughs> <laughs> they all around it. Not saying that linemen aren't athletes. I'd never say that. But I believe you told him I was going to be on the line. So don't. Uh, maybe it was a different interview, football. Mark. I don't know. Do you guys, you guys remember that, though? Remember, is that the football field? I, have, I still have that article. I have it downstairs yeah. in my. I found it yeah. not too long ago. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I would echo a lot of those things. I, you know, it's one of the funniest stories that I always laugh at. You know, we talk about 15 out of 16 years and things like that. And, you know, it's. I wouldn't call it a regret, but one of the things that I think would have been really fun was to, you know, play with one of you guys and, and uh, all that good stuff. And I know we got a few alumni games under our belts, but I don't know if we were in top physical shape to, to call that. Oh, goal line anymore. stand, Jeff. Goal line stand. We did have a goal line three. stand. Yep. Um, but, you know, talking about Rick and Kevin playing together, uh, and I'll I'll get some details wrong, but you know that was the Grundy Center game, and it was late in the game, I think, and we were probably on their side of the fifty, and uh, I don't know what formations were or anything like that, but Rick, you know, went for a little jaunt down the sideline, found his way in the end zone. Uh, Kevin threw one of the prettiest balls I've I've ever seen, uh, just perfect. Couldn't have been a better spot. Rick went to get it and went right through his hands, you know, and, you know, things happen and Rick's only a freshman and <laughs> Rick gets back to the huddle and older brother being supportive's comment is, I think, uh, Hey Rick, don't worry about catching the ball. You got three years left. <laughs> <laughs> Not very nice. Was it? Not very nice. Well, uh, yeah, the front yard them. wrestle match was payback for that right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just put two. Uh, two Kevin, I think for it to be payback, you would have had to throw him to his back. <laughs> but, and yeah, the other comment I'll make is, you know, collectively from the four of us, and like I said, I'll echo everything, but I think from, from our perspectives and from the amount of time that we spent around the, the West Hancock football, West Hancock schools uh, and things like that, you know, growing up in the school, uh, you know, mom and dad being the part of it uh, that they were, um, for someone to be back in Brit on the home farm um, doing what they're doing, I think it's pretty special that that's Mark. Uh, and I think, you know, he is the guy to be in that role. I think it's, it's always a great sense of pride for me because when I, you know, go to games and I, I see how Mark interacts with kids and, and, you know, I see Mark and, post-game interviews and you know he sounds grown up professional intelligent <laughs> uh all those sorts of things um I mean it's just for him to be doing what he's doing and doing it at the level he's doing and to be interacting with kids and being that influence uh and to have the coaching staff and to have the rest of those guys there uh doing what they're doing and moving that program forward um you know I think that's uh a pretty special thing and I'm I'm not doing it justice with how I'm saying it here because it you know to to the three of us that are watching what what they're doing with this football program and how that influences what's coming through the West Hancock School District um, is a pretty special thing you know I it's funny because you know when we go down to dome games and I'll have guys that I graduated with uh, they'll be texting me and They'll be like, geez, that that short little fat kid that's on the sideline coaching, that's Mark. Yeah, that's that's him. So <laughs> that's the guy that when we were seniors in high school and we were trying to beef up to get to 180 pounds, that's that short little turd of an eighth grader that was already 180 pounds. So <laughs> more than that. <laughs> but he was I 100 that. agree with you. 100 percent agree with you, Jeff. And one of the things I love to say is, you know, it takes a village and there's a lot of people pulling in the same direction in West Hancock schools and Britain Kanawha and people that care. And uh, a lot of things, a lot of people are doing their part to try to help these kids have a great experience and work hard and have fun. And that's pretty awesome. Pretty special. Well, Kevin, I have to say this then I, uh, I had, I'm the golf coach at I-35 and I had a couple kids make a, some poor choices the other night and I got made aware of it. And at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, I just called Kevin and said, hey, I want some advice here from a guy who's as close as I'm going to get to 
the guy I would be asking, and that would be your guys' dad. Um, and literally, Kevin said those words to me. It takes a village to raise kids because I was ticked at these kids, and I'm trying to create a golf program that I want to be successful as well. I'm like, I just – I. I felt bad afterwards. I'm like, I just called Kevin at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. He was probably in bed knowing him um, and his age. But uh, um, <laughs> so I had to talk to uh, talk to one of those kids this morning. I literally said that, like, you know, a lot of the same things. I'm like, it just and that just remind me of the upbringing we all had. You guys, especially with it being your dad, but just me as a, an athlete and a student at West Hancock. It was like, how would how would Coach Sanger respond to a situation like this? And, you know your dad probably could have kicked many kids off the football team or the track team over the years. But my mind kept going back to that, like this kid needs the golf team more than the golf team needs, you know, this kid. And um, so uh, just that's where my mind went right there. When Kevin said that, I was like, it just, again, didn't realize how good we had it until I'm in the situation where I have to make one of those choices and have one of those talks with the kid and, I for sure didn't do it justice as your dad probably would have, but I, at least that was where my mindset was at the time. So, you know what, Dan? That's and I know you're probably, I'm sure you're probably hit on this later on. But the thing I think about too is, and I don't think you realize, and I know all my brothers brothers have coached as well at some point in their life. But the thing is, I, I the things my dad did was was amazing. I mean, you talk about coaching for that long, that whatever, but the the amount of stuff. We talked about we talked about Lois Daily Own earlier. But the amount of time my mom has had to deal with things, and not even just just the random things that she had to do behind the scenes. And you talk about Dad being a sore loser, um, putting up with him on on days like that because he was. We're all sore losers. We're, we'll admit it. We aren't gonna lie about it. But just True. raising four boys, and you know my mom coached um, whether they were organized sports at the time or what it was. I can't remember. I, I talked to people about this, but I know my mom had her stitch. Love girls basketball was huge at the time with, with helping out and with, with coach Hudson and those teams and, and volleyball. I know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know all the stories, but just the different things that she did involved in the school, the pep club, the, I mean, she taught like four or five different classes. I don't even know what it is, but the, the amount of stuff that she was able to do. And you talk about the Sanger legacy fund and, you know, a lot of people, willingly default thinking about part of the, and I, I'm not saying I'm just speaking my mind, but about my dad's coaching career, but I tell you what the equal amount of impact that my mother has had on, on people in this community and this school is, is, is unbelievable. And so, and that's just me speaking my mind, but I think I know all of my brothers would, would back that up. And it's just the thing she's done is, is nothing short of amazing. Well, and I, I, think, I think when you get to the end of the day, uh, you know, none of this would be what it is without mom, because nobody is ever, ever giving more of themselves than what mom has. I, I don't know what she ever did for herself. I mean, she followed us four around. She supported dad and all the coaching. Uh, and I, you know, I think she got a lot of joy in that. Um, but mom is, she's give, give, give. I mean, hey, Linda, go cook 2,000 pounds of taco meat. Okay. <laughs> You know, the thing I always think, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off here, Jeff, but uh, mom was so passionate about what she was able to do with kids, with just being around kids and just being involved and be a part of their life. And not just us, but everybody. I mean, she just liked being involved, whether it be pep club or painting streets or popping popcorn or whatever. And well, I think of that all the time. If If we could all be so lucky to have a career or something we're passionate about, like mom or dad, or some of the teachers that we grew up with, or the coaches that we have, boy, we'd be pretty fortunate um, because it makes it pretty easy to get out of bed in the morning when you're passionate about something like that, and makes it certainly worthwhile. So I agree with you 100. percent And she started, so she started her, you know, teaching career at Grundy Center, is where she was there for, I believe, two years. And she was involved in starting, you know, some of the girls. I don't think the girls' sports were sanctioned at that time uh, at Grundy Center, but you know, she was she was involved in starting some of those activities for girls and carried I mean, carried a lot of that on and and was involved in it as she got to Brit and all the other, you know, athletics clubs, everything that she was involved with, you know, over the years. Saw that picture that was just on, that was just posted on the, you know, I grew up in Brit, Iowa, Kev of Kevin and I when we were we figured we had to be like six and three feeling you know, vegetables 
probably in that picture and the yeah doing the vegetables at the <laughs> pep club mom had her straight pants seat. on yeah yeah so what was that on? I, it was on that that facebook page i grew up in Britt, iowa uh, joanne dudgeon does that yeah uh, I grew up in Britain. Yeah, it's got mom's got her striped sixties pants on. Seventy six. Seventy six. And there's a bunch of people you recognize in the picture. Yep. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. And I remember going to those things. I remember being at those. Um, I don't think I probably remember that one in particular, but um, some of the later ones that we went to that uh you know, peeling vegetables and doing all that all that those kind of activities. I just remember in your mom's classroom the mounds of t-shirts at tournament time. She was always in charge yep. of the t and I'm like, and then my mind would go to, if it was coach Sanger in charge of that, <laughs> we'd be in a different, it'd be interesting, but she, I mean, just things like that, that I always think of is hundreds of shirts stacked on her desk and she'd be there at five in the morning and be there till dark. And like Jeff was saying, just always doing for other people and always doing the behind the scenes stuff. Um, just and a lot of kids, a lot of kids can fight it in here too. I mean, there's a lot oh. of kids going through a lot of different things that, that she, she helped a lot along the way. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, real quick here, before we wrap this up, you guys talked about the alumni game at central, uh, talking about who did this and who did what and whatnot. Uh, 2013, I believe it was. I was the defensive coordinator for the alumni game down in Central, and Coach Danks was the head coach. And I look out, and Coach Danks goes, all right, defensive players, go over here with Coach Crawl. We're going to talk about defense. Mark and Matt Paul, Coach Paulson and a bunch of other All-Americans, All-Conference players look at me, and I said, you guys do whatever the hell you want. I am, I'm just here to have fun. And Mark goes, all right, we're going to do the 52, whatever, and we beat, I think we literally beat the actual team. Granted, they're, you know, they shuffle in their twos and their threes and their fours and stuff. But I think scoreboard wise, we put some points on the board and Coach Mack comes over at one point and I don't remember his exact words, but it was almost kind of like, all right, guys, lay off a little bit because between Mark and then Ryan Johnson on the offensive line, just peeling out and, you know, it was pretty fun to see. But it, like going back to that Brit legacy at Central, it was, it was a big deal for me as a lowly student coach. Thanks to um, Jeff was actually the guy I first contacted and talked to. I was like, I thought I wanted to play college football. I realized I wasn't that good. And two, I still want to be a part of it. And Jeff, you know, got me hooked up with coach Mack and got me to be a student coach. But um, I took a lot of pride in just being a guy from Brit who got to be a part of the central program where there were so many Brit guys going through and having a lot of success. So, um, and then, I could always find your dad in the stands at those games because you would never look at the main stands where the bulk of people would sit. He was always in one of the side stands. And I never remembered him not having a bag of popcorn in his hand while he was watching the game. I don't know if he bought five or six bags before the game started, but like you could look back and there's popcorn. Um, but you always stand in kind of at the top row um, on one of those side bleachers home or away. And uh, just lots of good memories that you guys were talking about as well. So, well, he he loved the central games because he would he would interact with everybody. It didn't matter who was sitting next to him, who he ran across. If he'd start asking questions, he'd have a conversation, and and he'd have a new friend before he before he walked out. That and I always kind of laugh at that because he dad could. And I'm I'm not this way. Um, I think mom's probably more of an introvert, but da dad could strike up a conversation with, with just about anybody. And it didn't have to be about football or track or anything. He could, he could find some connection and have a conversation and go from there. And central football games, he would, yeah, he would interact with, with all sorts of people. Like he loved, he loved, it. He loved Saturdays just for the fact that, I mean, it was his way, whether win, lose or draw on Friday night, it was away from anything that he had any, that he had to worry about the organization because a lot of people don't understand. He maybe had two hours of sleep on most nights when he drove, uh, maybe, maybe a little more on that side, but he'd do the tapes and they don't do tapes. Like there were no huddle back then. Mm -hmm. You were actually dubbing those tapes. He, the contraption he had of the two TVs, one on top and one bottom, the two VCR tapes to the tapes so he could send to other coaches. And he never left until those were done. He would do those and send them off. And then he'd go home and sleep for a couple hours and then up and drive into Pella. And he loved it. 
Um, he'd do the interview. He'd do the KOW interview early and then be off to Pella. Yeah. Yep. Wherever the game was. Yep. Uh, I, I still think my favorite story, and I think I've said it on one of your episodes before, but uh, when I sat with your dad at state basketball one year, he it wasn't we had a conversation it was he talked to me for about four hours i i got a couple words in and he had said him and your mom had gone to arizona i think to see one of his siblings down there and it was one of the first times they had driven that long together just the two of them and he goes we had a great time we talked about all these things and you just talk about all the things they talked about in the car and then i ran into your mom either that day or at the next one round or i don't remember it was some other time I said, hey, coach told me about your trip to Arizona. How you guys had such a great time. She goes, that was the longest week of my entire life. <laughs> like, he didn't stop talking the entire time. It just killed me out. They had completely different perspectives on things. and But they uh, just, you know, great couple and worked so well together and um, did so much for the school as well. But it, it just cracked me up how you got two extremes about the exact same trip they took together it just still makes me laugh thinking about it so well, but uh yeah so anyway uh next up on the podcast in two nights you're talking about bob fenske him aj ellingson and zarin from kow we're going to do a, a call it a media episode and uh we we're supposed to do it last week bob got laryngitis and the morning of the podcast he goes i can't do it i can't talk and I said, we'll reschedule. He goes, no, 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 no. Just do it without me. And I said, no. Coach Sanger has said I, from Kevin that Bob Fenske was one of Coach's favorite newspaper reporters in his whole career. So I said, we're not doing it without you, Bob. So that's two nights from now on Wednesday, March 29th. And then I just got it completely lined up with the date, April 5th, all six of the Kelly brothers. Oh, I boy. started <laughs> notes on that. And I said, I don't know if I even need notes for that one. It might just be a go. <laughs> And then uh, the 1981 Boys Golf State Championship team, the 1996 Girls State Championship track team, and then Eric Cooley and Vance Hagen are going to do an episode. That'll be another PG-13 plus, probably. And then uh, Jack <laughs> Fisher, uh, the old principal at the school, Jack Fisher is going to do an episode. So uh, stay awesome. tuned for some of those episodes. That'll get us to mid-May or so. But like I always do... Um, there was something on your mind and you're like, oh, it just wasn't a good place to fit it in. Anything you guys want to say before we get off after an almost two hour episode? Yeah. Well, just thanks, Dan, for what you do. Um, this is awesome to listen to. And like I said, a lot of a lot of people contribute to uh, the good of what we have at West Hancock and Britt and Canal and a lot of good stuff. So appreciate everyone. Appreciate what you do, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. It's been awesome with that legacy fund. I mean, uh, we're able to give to support the students and some of the different community projects that are around town has been an excellent thing. And you're a huge part of uh, doing some of that stuff that we've gotten done. So appreciate all you've done. That wouldn't happen without your folks doing what they did first of all. I'm just, I'm just paying it back. So I'd like to throw out there, you know, we, we talk, this goes back and we talk a lot about history and kind of where we've gotten to where we are today. Right. With a lot of this. Um, but the future is bright. Right. I look at, I look at, uh, you know, these football seasons um, over the, the past several years, you know, the championships and runner-up finishes. You look at wrestling, the wrestling team this year. You had a, the Smith boys in the final, you know, a number of kids that were down there at the at the state tournament. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of optimism on, on track teams coming up this fall. You know, um, some of the winter sports, you know, I think the basketball teams, you know, uh, had pretty good seasons. Um, a lot of, you know, looking forward and, and – and just saying, you know, the, the future's bright and excited for, you know, the, these kids coming up um, for what they're going to do in these upcoming years and know, know that, you know, you know, us old guys like us that are jumping on the podcast still get excited to go watch and, and see what the teams are doing now and going forward with the, you know, with the kids that are in school and the kids that are coming up. Okay. Mark, speaking of the future, do you know our eight-man football schedule yet for this fall? Have you heard anything on? <laughs> I know we are the second smallest eleven-man football school in the state yep. of Iowa. Yeah. The, what did we say the other day? Point four students below the eight-man line, or something like that, with that free and reduced lunch. So, yeah. and that was that was the participation, the kind of the direction I was going of a school our size having that many kids that are playing football. 
and you get these schools with higher enrollment that are playing eight man, you know, I mean, that uh, it's, it's a great thing that, that you can still field these teams and have this much participation and support and, and, you know, field the teams that we can with the, uh, uh, with some of those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Not just fielding a team. I mean, you look at the last three or four years, I mean, that's, yep. We're, we're right there. And that's, it's like you said, that's, that's the kids, that's the coaches, that's the community. And, uh, you know, that's to say you're from Britt, Iowa is, yeah, there's, there's a lot of pride in that, at least for me anyway. So that's, that's fun. I, you know, I live down here in Monty. We're a basketball town, uh, you know, and, and uh, they don't quite have the, you know, they moved to eight man football. So I sat back and watched the 108 to 96 semifinal game or whatever it was. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dan, there's one last thing I'm going to say. It's it, like you said, it's not, I don't think corny, but the thing that gets overlooked, we talk, we've talked about a lot of head coaches, a lot of things you're talking about, but I think what is one of the most special things that we have in our community and our school system is the amount. And I think we talked about it a little earlier, but the amount of assistant coaches that have over the years, I think of my dad coaching football, all the different assistants that have come through there. I mean, too many to name all the assistant wrestling coaches, even track coaches. I mean, I've worked even with my dad and my parents, all coaches. I mean, just coming in myself as, as a young coach with, with Bob Dodge, Phyllis Jordanger are awesome in track and field. I know my dad had others in, in track as well, um, but just in the wrestling, I could name, there's a bunch of them. And, and the, the amount of people we have that care about our stuff and the assistant coaches are, are paramount to the success we've had. They really are, because you know as well as I do, you said you're, you're coach in high school. The head coach, as far as the coaching goes, there's not a whole lot of it sometimes. It's those other guys and gals that are doing the, the work behind the scenes that are making things go. And sometimes I don't think people realize that, but they are invaluable to what we have going on. I think that's a great way to end. Uh, thanks again, guys, all four of you Sangers. Uh, you mean a lot to a lot of people, <laughs> me as well. Um, gained you know good friendships with all you guys over the last couple of years and um, only about, what, four or five more months till football season. So life is good. So thanks again. If you're interested in buying a book, send me a message. If you want to sponsor a podcast, let me know. Otherwise, go Eagles. All right. Thanks, Dan. Go Eagles. Thanks, Dan.